Okay, I think uh, anyway, we're getting close to the number of people who signed up, uh, well, about halfway there. So I think we can safely get started. I know we have a lot to pack in uh, today. So uh, we'll get started and let's let peop the rest of the people filter in as we're going. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah, uh, sure. Welcome everyone. My name is Shauna Grail. I'm the director and an associate professor at the Urban Studies Program at the University of Toronto, and also the associate director of partnerships and outreach at the University of Toronto School of Cities. And it is a pleasure to be able to moderate today's uh, conversation and webinar. We are joined by Luke Nellor, uh, the marketing director at Antonium, and also by Professor Stephen Farber, who is a uh, professor in the Department of Human Geography at the University of Toronto Scarborough, and also has an appointment at the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto St. George. So as you're likely familiar, today's webinar is hosted by Pantonium in partnership with the University of Toronto's Transportation Research Institute and the School of Cities, and we'll be discussing the social benefits of on-demand transit. Um, many of you are also likely familiar that Belleville, the city of Belleville, introduced an on-demand transit system for its nighttime bus service in the fall of 2019 as a pilot project, and that system happens to be designed and managed by Toronto-based Pantonium, and it has since been made a permanent feature of Belleville's transit system. About a year following the introduction of operations, Professor Farber and his team from the City of Toronto launched an independently funded research project to evaluate the on-demand transit or ODT system and they did this work in partnership with Pantonia. So today's webinar begins with a presentation of the research team's finding, including emphasis on the social benefits of on-demand transit, uh, things like who uses it, why are they using it, what are their perspectives, and what opportunities does on-demand transit present for riders. Um, it happens that Professor Farber is a transportation geography expert, but also specializes in the study uh, and policy of a concept called transportation equity, which I'm sure you'll hear more about uh, in his presentation. So we'll be uh, beginning with a, a presentation on the uh, research findings of the study, and we'll then move to a discussion followed by a Q&A with all of the participants, all of you. To ask a question on this uh, webinar, there is a chat, there's both a chat feature at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, and there's also a little button that says Q&A, so you can either, I think you can either chat or use the Q&A to ask your question, and we will be monitoring um, those, uh, those screens in order to be able to see the questions, so there will be a chance to ask questions towards the last third of the webinar. And following the webinar, there will be a video of the webinar shared with participants and made available on Pantonium's website. So I'd now like to turn it over to Professor Farber for his presentation. Okay, thanks, Shauna. And I'm just going to uh, bring up my screen. Okay, so can I just get a Thumbs up or down if that looks okay to you all. And is the volume okay to everyone? Yep, yeah, it's loud and okay. clear. Okay, great. So um, thanks very much for setting us up, Shauna. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and to present these findings with you. Um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge um, the rest of my team, uh, Yijue Zhang and Misha Young, our uh, co-authors on all of this work with me. They're both PhD students uh, in the urban, uh, urban planning PhD students uh, under my supervision at U of T, and they've been working on this project with me from the very beginning. And just to set the project up a little bit, I think a lot of us are familiar with the pilot itself and on-demand transit in Belleville uh, as, a, as a pilot as, uh, already. So I just wanted to give some academic perspective on, on where we're entering into this discussion. And really the focus of my research and our research group at U of T is, is on how transportation uh, impacts uh, the well-being of disadvantaged communities in Canadian cities. And I think that um, 
the potential impacts of new mobility technologies on disadvantaged groups has been really kind of overlooked or at least needs to be uh, focused on more clearly because there's a lot of opportunities that could be gained by disadvantaged groups um, through the use of, of all of this technological innovation and disruption happening in the transportation space. And at the same time, looking around us, we're, we're very familiar with this problem of um, municipalities and transit authorities more or less being inundated by new opportunities to partner with tech companies in the transportation and mobility space. And I think that um, there's not a lot of guidelines or research out there that can help decision makers, A, choose which pilots to go forward with, and B, how to properly evaluate the success or failure uh, of these pilots. And especially around impacts on, on disadvantaged communities, it's really hard to know how we should be measuring return on investment in these technology partnerships in, in the transit and transportation space when we're really focusing on understanding how these things are going to um, impact disadvantaged groups. So I think that's where we, uh, you know, I'm coming in with this project and really trying to answer some of those questions with this research. And this is the only theory slide I'm going to share with you guys. Um, I know that we've got a lot of people uh, who have not been in a university class for a very long time, but, you know, uh, one of the ways that there's a theoretical framework called transport and social exclusion. It's very, you know, related to issues around transport equity that, that Shauna introduced. But the idea behind transport and social exclusion is it theorizes how socioeconomic disadvantages combine with transport disadvantages in order to create this condition called transport poverty. And people in transport poverty don't have the economic means in order to buy themselves out of a transport disadvantage. So if you don't have a car and you don't have good transit services, um, if you're wealthy, you can overcome that challenge by paying for, for, uh, for taxis and Ubers and all sorts of, or relying on your social capital, your social network for transportation. But if you're socially and economically disadvantaged and also suffering from transport disadvantage, you really get stuck and you don't have the means to get out of this, ish, this transport disadvantage. And over the long run, that means that people have, transport poor people have low levels of accessibility. They have a hard time reaching their daily activity destinations. And over a lifetime or years of, of suffering from transport poverty and inaccessibility, what we know is that people actually do less on a daily basis when they're suffering from transport poverty. They're going shopping less, they're going for job interviews less, they're not doing as many social and recreational activities. You know, and this really um, has a huge bearing on, on quality of life and well being. Um, and if you're, you know, and potentially uh, leading to real issues around social and economic exclusion that can further kind of feed back into um, entrenching social and economic disadvantages that people already have. So the idea behind this work, um, you know, a lot of my work over the last decade or so has really been about picking apart different elements of this chart and trying to um, find data, conduct surveys, models that help us understand different arrows in this chart. The particular research project that we're looking at today is really over here. And what we see is that on-demand transit in Belleville might be a policy response to intervene on these transport disadvantages. We have a situation where there's not sufficient transit, especially at night in Belleville. We can intervene with this new technology and theoretically, that intervention should find its way through accessibility and activity participation and well-being. So what we're doing with our study is trying to trace that the impacts of this intervention through this chart, essentially. And we do that um, uh, with survey analysis, interviews, uh, uh, a ride along on the bus. Uh, you know, a whole lot of kind of multiple methods to do that. But today I'm really going to focus on our, our survey that we conducted of the transit users themselves. This is just a map to show you that this, this issue really does exist. This isn't Belleville, this is Toronto where a lot of my research takes place. What I'm showing you in red are pockets of Toronto 
where we find people are in transport poverty. So this is locations where we have clusters of low income populations living with low levels of transit accessibility. And what that actually results in is these uh, suppressed levels of daily activity participation. So this is pre-COVID times, of course, but you know, uh, a typical Torontonian might make two to two and a half activities on average per day out of home activities. But we're seeing these pockets where low incomes intersect with poor transit availability. We're seeing these pockets where people are doing half an activity per day or one activity per day on average. This is real evidence that this whole framework um, really does exist. And now what we're trying to do is see what kind of interventions can we pilot and study that would help turn these red areas gray again, right? Eliminate these, these, um, these deprivations that exist in out of home activity patterns. So the big question for Belleville in this study is, well, how do we quantify these kind of social benefits of on-demand transit? And the way that we do that, Shauna set us up nicely, is we ask who is using the services. We ask about the reasons that they're using it, the frequency of use. We're also looking at satisfaction with different aspects of the services. And then broadly speaking, we've asked people to tell us about how those services have impacted their lives. Okay, so this is, um, all kind of self-stated survey data that we're basing our analysis on for now. We conducted the survey uh, mostly in November of 2019, but we kept it open in order to keep responses coming in until around Christmas time, December 21st of 2019. At the time that we collected our survey, there were about 1300 people who had actually um, registered and taken a trip on the on-demand transit system. And through our partnership with Pantonium and the city of Belleville, we were able to invite all of those known users via email to participate in our web survey. We also handed out flyers via the bus drivers of the late night bus in order to um, uh, further recruit people who maybe wouldn't respond to an email uh, invitation. In the end, uh, we had about a 20% response rate, which is par for the course in this uh, industry, I would say, and um, the sample size is uh, 260 odd uh, respondents. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm kind of going to give you high level results of, of what we found in the survey. So the first thing that I'd like to just say is that primarily uh, the riders were, were quite young. So um, the majority of our riders were in this 15 to 30 year old age group. Um, I think this is um, both a function of uh, who's doing activities at night, who would do those activities by transit versus other modes like driving, and um, potentially, although we can't say conclusively, there might be some technology issues um, uh, as well, given the, the kind of the very low numbers of, of older adults uh, using the services. Gender balance, gender was quite balanced, but as people got older into this group in the 30 to 50 year olds, we see more women than men using the services. Um, in terms of household composition, what we find is that um, even though kind of most people in Belleville live alone or live with like in two person households, most of the users of our trans of the on-demand transit service lived in four or five person households. And if you Compare that to this slide where we look at the income distribution, we can start seeing a real story around trans about socioeconomic disadvantage of the users of the system. So we find that people are on very low incomes, the majority earning less than $20,000 a year, right, in these two bars, um, and living in these very large households. So I think these are users who uh, clearly are showing signs of socioeconomic um, deprivation. Um, at the same time, however, we find that most of the users are employed, 46% um, part-time, 33% full-time, and about a quarter of the users are students. Um, of those students, one of the interesting things that we found is that most of the students using the service are international students attending Loyalist College, mostly from South Asia and mostly from India. So there is this group of international students uh, who have come to 
Belleville to study at Loyalist College. Um, their tuitions are quite high, as international tuitions tend to be in Ontario. And in order to pay those tuitions, they're taking um, employment opportunities, and those opportunities come at night when they're not in classes. And the transit system is really part of this puzzle of how these international students are able to um, work and pay for their uh, to pay for their studies while they're uh, uh, in Belleville for you know one to three years while we're while they're in that college program. What about transport disadvantage? What we found is amongst the users that responded to our survey, almost no one owned their own car. So as you can imagine in a medium or small town in Ontario, the automobile is really the dominant form of, of mobility. And if you have a car, people use the car. And what we are finding is that, especially in the nighttime transit users, um, these were people coming um, from households where they didn't have access to their own vehicles. Um, that being said, about 50% of respondents said they could ask a friend for a ride or a family member for a ride. And anecdotally, what we found out in some of our qualitative work is a lot of those nighttime workers switched from taking shared rides at night with their coworkers to being able to be independent and get to and from work using the on-demand transit instead, which is actually a really significant outcome, I think. Um, because the trips are booked by um, primarily through smartphones, uh, we found that 80% of these very low income, you know, even though they're a very low income population, 80% had a smartphone, 70% had a data plan on their smartphone. So there could still be issues around technology and digital divide. And there have been, there are call in options for, for booking as well. But um, you know, I think that those barriers to use need to be investigated um, further. One of the things that we didn't do in our study is uh, really speak, spend a lot of time with non-users. So um, I think that could be a, a very good uh, next step to understand what barriers exist for non-users. Um, I'll skip over, I just wanted to show you on this plot that amongst the lowest income groups, the only 35% compared to 50% on average, said that they can um, get a ride from a friend or family member if they needed to. So again, this is quite a severely socioeconomically um, depressed group, as well as a transport disadvantaged group in terms of automobile ownership and access. Okay, so is the service um, targeting uh, low income disadvantaged communities? Maybe not specifically, but um, in the end, that's who's really uh, taking advantage of these of the new service in Belleville, uh, by and large. Okay, um, what about changes in travel behavior over time? What we find, and I'm sorry, it's a bit of a complicated plot, but we've split the sample. We split the this question up into three time periods. Um, right now is during the on-demand transit pilot or during the delivery of those services. For six months prior to the on-demand night bus, there was a fixed route night bus that kind of circulated around the city in a, in a very large uh, route circulating around. And before that fixed route night bus, there was no night bus at all. And what we're seeing, we've asked people to think back to those different periods of time and tell us how often they went out and conducted activities at night. At night. And what we're seeing is that overall, there's been an increase in activity participation at night through these three phases of time. Okay, there's some complications in the details, but the main story is that activity participation rates, self-stated, are going up as these services are being delivered. But when we asked about how people were going out at night before, what we found is primarily um, the modes share is coming from active travel modes. Okay, so for sustainability reasons, that's something to really pay attention to, that the um, overall trip rates are up and activity rates are up, but for people who were going out before, a lot of that was happening by foot and, and bike, mostly by foot, really. Uh, and a lot of that has now switched to bus. And okay, there's a sustainability issue there, but I think that the benefits of being able to uh, go anywhere in your city rather quickly on a bus is, you know, far outweighs the um, 
the accessibility that people have by foot for nighttime uh, travel. Okay, so we do see that a lot of the ridership came from active travel, but that's probably means a huge individual benefit for the people who are now able to take a bus instead of a long nighttime walk to or from work. Okay, why are people using um, on-demand transit? Uh, we allowed people to answer multiple uh, times to this question. So people could say they were doing multiple things when they used on-demand transit. About 70% of users are, are using ODT for work, um, which is not a big surprise. But what we are really kind of interested in seeing is how much people are using um, night bus services for groceries, visiting friends and family, and somewhat for recreational activities. Okay, so this isn't only about getting workers to work. This is also enabling people to participate in these essential quality of life activities that are needed. Food insecurity is a huge issue in Canada. Um, social capital development and the ability to, to, um, to be with friends and family, to care for one another is very important. And of course, recreation um, has huge um, well-being benefits as well. Not surprisingly, because it's a night bus, we're not seeing a lot of school trips, but we, you know, students said that they, if they have to stay late on campus at night, they can get home now. But it's not the main use of, of the night bus. All right, in terms of satisfaction, uh, we've, we've split things up into two categories. Um, one is uh, satisfaction with the performance of the night bus. And where possible, we are able to compare satisfaction levels with uh, between ODT and, you know, in quotes, a fixed route bus service or the regular bus. There's some issues with comparing things. Um, not everyone has had experience with night bus service at night that wasn't ODT. So we're not exactly 100% sure what people are responding to in all cases here. But I think that it's quite clear that we might have some performance satisfaction issues um, in Belleville, uh, with, with in, in two cases primarily, um, uh, issues around uh, how long people end up waiting at the bus stop for their bus to arrive after they've scheduled a trip. And the app will recommend a time window for you to be at the bus, bus stop to, to, to pick to, for the bus to arrive. And people are unsatisfied with that time window or with the bus coming after that time window expiring. And the other is kind of people feeling unsatisfied with how long they have to be on the bus when they are, um, when they are uh, en route or in vehicle time. Or, you know, a, a lot of uncertainty about how long a potential trip might take on a night given, you know, what the other demands on the system are at that time. So I would say that, um, you know, the averages there are, uh, uh, need to be Im Im improved. And if we redid the study today, they might be improved. This was during the pilot and things, the system and the apps were being tweaked throughout the data collection period. It's also a possibility that, um, that a certain number of travelers tried it once or twice or three times or more earlier on in the system and got burned or had bad experiences that, that, um, that they are responding to in this question at, at this point. So, we, you know, I think that there are uh, um, groups of, of respondents here, some who have kind of had bad experiences and, and aren't satisfied with reliability and, and, and detour and others that seem okay with it. But on average, this is lower than we would like to, to see satisfaction levels being on these key 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 attributes of the system. Um, and I think that that Luke and Pantonium and, and, and others have more to say about what's being done and where some of this can be coming from. Um, in terms of this quality of service, this is, you know, kind of customer service, the, the bus quality, the, the driver competence, um, the, the bus stop uh, quality, you know, we see fairly high levels of, of of satisfaction overall with Belleville Transit Services, and not a lot of difference here between those using the on-demand transit services and those using the regular daytime bus. It is the same company, it is the same bus drivers, it's the same bus stops and vehicles. So 
um, it's, you know, we're not seeing major discrepancies here and that's as expected. Okay, um, I'm gonna delve into a few more slides now about kind of self-stated um, impacts uh, that on-demand transit ha has had on our respondents' lives. So first of all, we asked whether or not on-demand transit has specifically enabled increased, decreased, or no change in participation in a whole slew of different types of daily activities. And what we see is that the majority of respondents, or about 50%, maybe just under the majority, um, are saying that they're able to work more, conduct recreational social activities more, visit friends and family more, go shopping more, and get groceries more. And to a lesser extent, kind of, um, there's no real impact on healthcare and appointments. This is a night bus. No real impact on school trips. Again, it's a night bus. And gym and physical activity, I guess people don't take the bus to go for a jog, you know, um, or do that physical activity. But I think that makes sense. So we're seeing kind of self-stated, um, we specifically asked, is ODT allowing you to do more of these things in your life? And people are saying, yes, we think, we think that's true. I think that um, given a you know, future investigation, we would like to look into these people who are actually saying, no, ODTs had a negative impact on my activity levels. And I think that we would find a correlation between people who have had bad experiences with the system, um, maybe with reliability or wait times or those, and, and people, so people who are saying they're unhappy with those levels, and then people who are saying that, that they're now not able to do as much at night. Um, these are small, small numbers here, you know, 25 out of 260 people, but it's worth um, looking into those, those cases for system improvements, I think. Um, in terms of employment activities, what we find is, you know, 70% of people flat out saying, because of ODG, I can take a job at night. And 40% of people saying, I have a better job now that I can, that I have more travel options at night than I did before. In terms of kind of general reflection on, on travel at night, people are saying that ODT does make travel at night more convenient, that people are willing in general to go out more and do more trips at night. And you know, more than 50% of people saying that they can participate in more meaningful and enjoyable activities at night because of the ODT system. So these are really strong, um, positive you know responses so even though we have that reliability hiccup in satisfaction levels say um, overwhelmingly people do feel satisfied and um, feel like the provision of this uh, on-demand transit service is positively impacting their economic and social lives in terms of uh, kind of more zeroed in on social activities people responding positively to being able to see friends and family, um, to do more social and leisure activities, uh, feeling like a stronger sense of social belonging or cohesion, participation in arts and culture. I mean, it, it's really quite striking that overall people are, you know, think that transit at night is really important and that they're responding that, um, that this, tr that this, socioeconomically disadvantaged group of travelers especially is really able to make more of their lives because of the provision of transit in the evening uh, and nighttime period. So um, I'll wrap it up and, and we should use the rest of the time for conclusions, but you know, we really do see that ODT is providing a service in Belleville for primarily low income travelers. They're mostly employed riders, uh, either part-time or full-time employed. It, ridership is quite frequent. A lot of people using the service four times a week and uh, many more using it two to three, you know, two or more times per week. And over the period of time, it looks like frequency is rising, frequency of use is rising. Those are strong signs that this is a useful service being delivered. Um, we think that it looks like a lot of the ridership is being drawn from activities that were previously being done by active modes of travel. But we also know that overall, there's more activities being done now. So some of those riders are coming from mode shifting from active travel, 
And some are just new activities being done at night that weren't being done before. And that's a really important uh, metric going forward to measure the social impact of, of um, these uh, new mobility technologies. Um, you know, just to zero in on this economic, this one economic figure, 70% of the riders are using it for a nighttime commute. So in terms of how nighttime transit can improve the labor market or labor conditions of workers in your city or town, I think that it's really clear here that if you offer this service, um, it's going to be used for those really key economic reasons like employment, but a great you know, side benefit that we saw is 40% using it for shopping, for grocery shopping and other types of activities as well. So big co-benefits. If your main driver is getting people to work, you can also expect shopping and leisure uh, and grocery shopping outcomes coming with it as well. So um, just like again, to acknowledge Yishui and Misha uh, for doing this research with me, we did have funding from Shirk and some match funding from Qtric to do this work. And Pantonium and Belleville were very instrumental in kind of helping us um, understand the system, how to design it, giving us access to some of their data sets and how to recruit their riders and speak to their riders. So thank you for that as well. And that's um, it. I think we should move to questions now. Steve, thank you very much. It's a, it, it's a fascinating case study and a, and a really kind of timely example of the role that, that transit in, plays in, in a municipality of any size, and particularly in a, in a small municipality, um, where your data so clearly shows that the, uh, you know, the opportunity to have transit at night and on-demand transit opens up new opportunities um, for, for work and for other kinds of social engagement. And it's particularly timely, timely in this sort of current circumstances around COVID and uh, challenges with ridership, but also really, you know, it's so obvious that transit serves such an important role in um, providing services to marginalized groups, uh, socioeconomically uh, deprived groups in some cases who otherwise have no way to travel either to work or to groceries or to see family. Um, so highlighting these equity issues now is even more important than it was uh, probably when you conducted the work. Um, I want to move into the, the questions, and I think we'll start uh, with a question first to Luke, and then maybe Steve, you could answer. Um, but I wonder if you could, you could talk about what's unique about on-demand transit with respect to quality of life improvement for riders. Is this something that Pantonium considered when they launched uh, and developed this, this software? Um, and is, are these quality of, of life improvements something that we would see regardless of whether it's on demand or not? So what is unique about the on demand piece in this? Yeah, so um, I think what's unique about this approach is the, uh, the coverage uh, um, of the service um, in the city. And that's, I think, to go back, uh, why it was, why we were surprised by what happened was, you know, you know we had one fixed route covering Belleville at nighttime before and before there was nothing. So, but that, but that one fixed route covered, it tried to cover most of the city. Um, specifically, it went through the main employment corridor of Belleville. And then it tried to, to basically loop around the rest of the city. And I think there's, there's a map in the report and you can see what it looked like before. And what, what happened when we went to on demand is suddenly, and there was about 70 bus stops on that fixed route. So, and Belleville has about 300 bus stops. So when we switched to on demand, we made all 300 bus stops in Belleville available to be picked up and dropped off at. And that's where the ridership came from. So when Belleville started, they were, car they were carrying a few dozen people a night on that fixed route. And it, it, it was obviously it was reliable for those people taking it. Um, but when you increase the coverage of the service to the entire city to have hundreds of bus stops, suddenly the ridership increased. Um, and clearly that that's a sign for us 
and we did not expect that. You know, it was the first first test uh, run of the system, and what it's clear that because more stops were available and suddenly public transit was covering more space with the same amount of resources, um, it's clear that people thought it was more convenient. It was suddenly a convenient option for them because now if I didn't live along that one fixed route, I now have an option to have access because Belleville had a good network of bus stops um, existing already where everybody was pretty much living within walking distance. So that change um, and people voted with their with their wallets. It, it was clearly a, val a, a, a in, an improvement on the service, and that's why we had a surge in ridership. Um, yeah, and I think that's I, I, one thing that we haven't been able to look at yet is, and one thing that um, we might be able to compare now with uh, what's going on in Belleville recently, but in comparing where you had to transfer from a bus before. So because there was only one bus route at nighttime when, that we replaced, nobody had to transfer ever. There was no transfers done at that nighttime service. Um, and I think one thing that transit agencies know is that transfers add a lot of friction and, and inconvenience to riders. Um, and one thing that ODT can do is eliminate the need for transfers because if you have if you're just booking a trip point to point in a town and every bus stop is available in a town, transfers are no longer needed. Um, so a few of the projects we're doing now, will we're gonna see if that is the case that riders like ODT because it can eliminate transfers. But I mean, that's probably for a study in the future though. Steve, do you wanna weigh in on this too? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I'll echo that. I think that the main benefit is, is coverage. Um, and that is even though you can design, um, you can design a, a route, um, you know, uh, uh, as perfectly a, a, as possible, but it's not going to cover, uh, you know, one bus route isn't going to cover uh, travel demand for a region, even a small, even a smaller city like, like Belleville. So I think probably um, the co-benefits that come along with with what we saw in our survey, like being able to do grocery shopping and being able to do those other types of activities, you know, it becomes harder and harder to make opportunities for those alternative purposes when you are, say, primarily designing a bus route at night to, to service the manufacturing district with nighttime shift workers. How do you also, you know, make sure that that route can stop at grocery stores and stop at Walmart and stop at the other employment locations that aren't concentrated in that one district. I, I think that it becomes really, really difficult. So uh, although, you know, we didn't study this, I would say my, my opinion is, is that um, going to on-demand came with a lot of those additional, um, well, those side benefits come with a lot of that. Uh, of, just of that just to add to that, you didn't study that, but the Ryerson, in part, part of this project, Ryerson University also did a study of the Belleville data that we provided them. Um, and in that study, they were doing more of the operational things, not the social side of things. But they did realize that about 50, half the trips were for clearly for employment, but the other half were not for employment. And they, their conclusion was that a fixed route service wouldn't, been, wouldn't have been able to capture that unique mix of riders together. It was kind of, you'd either have to have one fixed route for the employee transportation and another fixed route for all those other alternative trips. But this platform has managed to service both of those simultaneously. Right. You know, I have two other questions I want to ask, and then there is a lot of conversation on the Q&A, so we'll move to that soon. But Belleville is a relatively small municipality, about 65,000 people in total. Um, there are many small municipalities that can benefit from ODT service, uh, in part because it helps with very dispersed populations. Uh, but what about larger cities? Can larger cities see social benefits? Would we expect them to see social benefits from, from ODT and, and what might be different and how could other municipalities learn from this example? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's, you know, we, we need a whole webinar just to cover that, the scalability of this. Um, I would say, if you think of it, um, ODT is 
is really the mo is a much lower cost uh, minimum viable product for transit service for covering large areas. So just to unpack that, um, to think of how much as a transit agency, uh, you know, think of how much it costs you to run a fixed route service covering all your stops with a minimum headway of 30 minutes. You know, that costs a lot of money. And, and especially now with low ridership and whatnot, transit agencies are even more constrained. So really this is the most scalable transit service available because you need far fewer buses to cover the same number of stops. Now, of course, when you get, when you start talking about peak demands in a city like Toronto, where a lot of the bus routes are rammed full of people and they're, you know, 70 people crammed onto a double articulated bus, ODT has no place there. But for a large, you know, city, for a large city with many stops and many neighborhoods, especially on the fringes where there is low demand and really it costs far too much to provide a service that's economical there, um, that's, those spaces are where ODT um, can be easily deployed and in, in, in an economical way. Yeah, and I mean, I'll add to that and say that, um, you know, nighttime services in general in, in large municipalities, um, you know, most nighttime networks operate on a skeletal network. Um, and, and we know how important shift work is to kind of disadvantaged communities. And there's a big mismatch in when services are available and when um, kind of uh, nighttime travelers uh, need to get to, nighttime workers need to get to work and get home from their shifts. And that's a big burden that they that they're placed in or that they're subjected to. Um, so you know we talk about first and last mile issues generally speaking in transit, but I think that you know when we have a nighttime network, the first and last mile issues become um, much more uh, uh, pointed. And, you know, we really want someone to take a bus, you know, a 40 minute bus ride home from their night shift and then have to walk one and a half kilometers, you know, or two, like in the middle of the night. So I think that, that there's opportunity for integration between on-demand transit and the skeletal, kind of the backbone night bus network. And maybe that's where this opportunity can be exploited within some of the big municipalities as we get started uh, with, with trying to, to pilot some of these things in the larger cities. I think that is a clear case for surrounding municipalities to pilot and test on-demand solutions that can bring um, lower density communities into kind of uh, rapid transit uh, connected areas, uh, you know, so for inter-network connectivity. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm going to move to the uh, the very active Q&A uh, now um, because there are a lot of great questions here and there's a voting system. So if you see a question and you think it should be asked, you can vote for it. The, the top the top voted question with seven thumbs up is uh, from Sandra. Has there been interest from a larger transit agency such as in Toronto to pilot ODT as part of its COVID recovery? Um, and if not, is there some agency you would approach for this? Yeah. Uh, so well, we are, it, it's been an, an interesting few months. So uh, I can't speak much to Toronto. I know we've been talking to the TTC for quite some time. They know about us. I think for an agency of that size to do any meaningful change in the midst of an emergency, um, the, the timelines don't really match. So they know about us. And I think in, over the next few months, we're going to continue to talk about how on-demand transit can be used by anybody to help kind of transition into that post, uh, the post-COVID world. Um, and I would say that there's been other agencies that we've been talking to that they've accelerated their plans of working with us because of COVID. And it's really a no-brainer when your ridership plummets 80 percent um you kind of need to start thinking agilely and and changing up the the program so i think covid in a way is, is pushing transit agencies to, to do more innovation like this because there is no you know you can't keep doing what they've been doing for the last 30 years because things have radically changed yeah 
I did notice in the last webinar that the person from Belleville Transit talked about how they actually just shifted their entire system to yeah, ODT yeah. while they're managing through yeah. the crisis. Yeah, and I think Paul is in the chat, so if anybody has any questions for him, just shoot him a, shoot him a, a chat, a message. Yeah. Moving back to the social equity uh, piece, uh, a question from Willem. When it comes to ODT, what do you think is missing in the service design and delivery of the service from a social inclusion and equity lens? So, I mean, actually Willem, thanks for the question. And I think that, um, I think that, you know, well, my cheap answer is that we still need to do more work to understand um, in a place like Belleville who has decided not to use the service. And until we do that um, study, I, I really think that we'll have a hard time understanding um, what's missing. Um, you know, of course, um, the typical kind of calls from acad academia are, are issues around the digital divide. So meaning some people are able to um, use the technologies that are required to, to use this, the transit service and others just simply, simply can't or won't adapt or, or, or you know, don't have the money or the knowledge or the technological prowess. You know, there's a whole lot of reasons why, why there's a digital divide. So I think that's something that, that we really need to look into more. And, you know, in Belleville, you can call in to a, and speak to a person or leave a message and book your trip um, by phone. But I still think that's a real departure from what um, uh, uh, old timer type transit users are used to be needing to do in order to get around. And it's if it, for people with grandparents and great grandparents, you know how difficult it is for, to learn new skills and, 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 and adapt when things around you uh, change. So. So I think issues around digital divide and age discrimination and, and things like that need to be um, better studied. And the approach we took in the end with our survey um, isn't the right approach to do that, right? Because we really only focused on users and riders. So these are people by their very nature at least managed to get around the initial barrier. They all managed to take their first trip at least, right? So who didn't take a trip? and why, and I think we really need to understand that. Yeah, and uh, I will add that in Belleville is its own case and it's, it's in, like every municipality is different. So we've had, uh, had a, a client um, in the US and they're predominantly, the ridership is, is old, older people, you know, 50s, 60s and 70s are the ones using it and nobody used the app, they all called in, um, but that's, and though they were used to an on-demand service already, um, and we basically just expanded that service and made it uh, cover more areas for more time, and that's really all we did. But predominantly, it was it was the elderly, and predominantly they were using the phone. So, it, it, in every city, it's going to be different. I think like Belleville did have a young population, and, and they picked it up and ran with it. So, uh, it's so from the data we've got, it appears that those are the people using it. But in other cases. It really depends on what the transit agency is working with in terms of ridership. And I think it's, it's a, always a good question to ask before you implement these things, who do you actually intend to use it? And do you have any data to back that up? Uh, and that's what we always ask as well, because there's definitely ways that the technology can be adjusted to help. Um, and you, your operational setup can, can help deal with those accessibility issues, but you need to know what you're dealing with before you, yeah. you get into it. Yeah, and I think like the daytime versus nighttime dichotomy is is really important in the Belleville case as well yeah. and just like trying to understand how much demand is there for nighttime travel on the tr by transit you know for elderly populations yeah. um, that demand could be very very low and that's maybe it's not a barrier it's just that it's a little yeah there's they're, they're sitting at home watching Matlock or something uh, there is a question on the Q&A, and, and I have a similar question in my list around, um, was the research, and it sounds like you've partnered uh, at Pantonium with, with researchers from at least two universities, uh, University of Toronto and Ryerson and possibly others, but was the research built into the pilot project or, or baked into the plans you had? Um, with Belleville, and could you talk a little bit about the experience of 
both working collaboratively with a transit agency as well as with academic researchers? Yeah, um, so the, the reason why, the, so the initial Belleville project was, it was started, Pan, basically Pantonium had this idea. We reached out to, to Belleville and proposed it. Um, and then we partnered with, with an agency called Qtrick, um, which is a Canadian, uh, is a, a basically a Canadian group funding innovative projects in transit. And part of their requirements was two academic partners working with the project in order to have a more holistic approach. So I, it, it was it, from the very start of the project, we intended to do two research projects around it. And I think from Pantonium's perspective and also Belleville's perspective, we want outsiders to look at the project and make uh, and just research it um, as a neutral party. You know, you know, Steve didn't really, you know, you pulled some punches, but you were still looking at it with a clinical, a clinical look at, at how we, how this project went. And so from the start, that's what we wanted to do. Um, and I think, and, and Belleville was, you know, completely supportive. And I know it's the, the, the fact that they were willing to share the data of the project. I think that's very critical. Um, so Pantonium, we don't own the data that we used. We, Belleville owns it, but Belleville was willing to share with academics to, to generate some research out of it. And I think that's an important, um, you know, cities and universities, go, they go together very well. So, you know, if, if a, a private company like Pantonium can also be involved in, and throw in a, or hat into that kind of partnership, you know, it, it works very well. Do you want to weigh in on the on the partnership? Because it is, you know, yeah. relatively unique, the work that, that's going on here. Yeah. Um, so as a researcher, I mean, I should say that I was kind of conducting research like this um, in advance of the development of this specific project uh, and that um, that it really kind of aligns with um, what I was doing prior to, to the project and that um, and as a researcher, a quantitative researcher, we're always looking for 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 data and and in these times, uh, a lot of the data is held um, by um, private companies. And I think when I got started with this, this was an opportunity to kind of um, get my hands on a new type of data set, say that that Pantonium had in its operational database, you know, trip histories and things like that. Um, but it quickly evolved into um, so much more than that. And, um, you know, I think that, it, that it, it really worked in this case um, really well. And, and, uh, and part of that's because of just like the openness from our partners to kind of say, you know what, Steve, we're interested in an in impartial results and impartial findings and an impartial research partner. And, and I mean, that's music to our ears. So um, it, was, it was really a great relationship from our perspective because all of the doors were opened, access for recruitment, access to bus drivers to speak to, access to riders, access to data sets, everything was opened up. And in exchange, it was just a trust that um, we were gonna do, you know, responsible, high quality work and and I think that it worked both ways in that regard. Are there plans to do more, more research, more study in Belleville or of this pilot in the future? Um, no, not at this time, but with all the COVID stuff going on. So as you mentioned, we had a webinar where Belleville had gone fully on demand during the daytime, just in response to this. So, you know, there's lots of plenty of opportunities, I think, for, for future research in Belleville, but also we're deploying to cities all over Canada and in the US, and those are all generating data as well. So there's definitely room for, for more research. And I know, Stephen, we could talk a long time about what, what el other ideas we have to, that we want to look into. Yeah. I mean, I'll put a, a little bit of a plug in, though, or just a message for municipalities and, and potentially researchers who are out there. One of the things that we struggled with with our work is by the time we went out into the field to collect our data, 
it was hard to find respondents who had um, prior experience uh, or, or, uh, or a reliable ability to tell us about what their transit and activity patterns were like before ODT came to town. So a lot of our users were these students, right? A lot of the students hadn't been in Belleville before ODT was there. So we're, it, it really limited our, under, our ability to do a truly controlled kind of uh, pre-post uh, survey design or study design. So I would really urge um, people out there to, to partner with research teams from the very beginning let the research team go in in advance of the delivery of the service to get real baseline data uh, that's separate from the, the, the post-intervention data collection efforts. I think that that's probably the thing that um, uh, most limited our study. And then, and then also to kind of speak to those who did use the system and those who didn't use the system and, and get both of those perspectives. So going forward, those were kind of two lessons learned um, from this experience for the researchers and the evaluators about well, how, how do we design a better study the next time around. And I think that there, are, there's, there, are, there will be next time arounds with, with Luke and Pantonium and there's next time arounds with um, the 10 other kind of uh, technology disruptions taking place right now in, in our region and across Canada. So this, that's a lesson learned that could be applied very broadly. I wonder if we could conclude, we're running out of time, but if we could conclude with some discussion of the kind of policy implications. So we, you know, we have this data now that shows us how on-demand transit provides and serves some equity uh, principles in, in Belleville in particular, how it opens up access to people who otherwise don't have that access. It creates new opportunities. What, what does this mean in terms of making changes and implementing changes to the service, but also in terms of policy, in terms of thinking about the role of transit more broadly? So I'll let Luke answer about ODT, but I'll take a stab first actually and say that, you know, I think um, what this demonstrated really is the importance of understanding um, the current barriers to activity participation amongst disadvantaged communities in Canadian cities. And that our planning processes need to adapt in order to A, better understand the needs of these disadvantaged groups, and then B, design services that can cost effectively improve the well-being of the most disadvantaged uh, communities in our cities across Canada. So I think that, that this is evidence that we can get that understanding that we can use technologies in a socially responsible way to improve the lives of disadvantaged people, that we can have real impact and that we need to kind of start prioritizing that mission overall. Um, and especially in the time of COVID where honestly speaking, the vast majority of people who have the option to avoid transit right now will be trying to avoid transit for the foreseeable future. So what are we going to do about all those people who are left behind? Yeah, uh, I think that's, yeah, couldn't have said it better myself, Steve. Um, I, I think what we need to look at for on a municipal policy level is clearly every city needs to have at least the, the smallest, most baseline on-demand transit service to, to at, least, and at least test it out and see what happens. Um, and I think every city can afford to put two buses on the road late at night and see you the ridership that they get. Um, and I think, I'm not sure if that's, this is gonna be a, a provincial or, or like a very top down um, type of approach, but clearly, and especially as it, with COVID, you can't leave everybody behind who are, who are stuck with transit and you can't just cut the service down to the bare bones um, and only keep the milk run routes um, because you are going to leave people behind and, and transit is probably already leaving people behind. So let's try to use on-demand transit um, and see if we can just get even more people um, onto the bus, um, not just 
stuck walking. Um, and I think partnerships with universities uh, and municipalities can help show that there is a good return on investment for this um, and a, a, a true social benefit uh, uh, by using uh, on-demand transit. Thank you. I think that's a, a great way to close. We do have to um, wrap up now. I want to thank you, uh, Steve uh, and Luke, for your participation and your comments and all of the knowledge that you've shared. Thank you to everybody who participated and asked questions. Um, if we didn't answer your question yet, then I think we will be able to answer it. There is a copy, a link to the actual study um, that Steve presented on in the um, invite, I believe, or in the webinar information. And we can share that as well, I imagine, when we share the webinar video. Uh, thank you to Pantonium for hosting and to our partners, U of T Transportation Research Institute and the School of Cities. Have a great afternoon, everyone.